All right. Welcome to our Tuesday night meeting on January 10th. And um, I don't see anybody, any guests here, and maybe there's some online, but if so, welcome. And um, we can get started with our six o'clock discussion items. Great. The first item we're going to discuss is the conference of planning process. Uh, and Anna Crane, our director of planning and development services, is going to walk through a presentation. So this presentation has been uh, made to the plan commission and two separate presentations. We've just combined it here. Um, so really the goal is to show you or go through what the comprehensive plan process is. So what is an introduction to comprehensive planning, some differences between zoning and planning, and then talk about who's gonna be involved in the process. So I'll, I'll try to go through this fairly quickly. Feel free to stop me if you have um, questions as we go through. So what is a comprehensive plan? This is really a policy document that acts as a guide for our decision making moving forward. It's tied to various departments and zoning and ordinances come kind of after this policy document, but it really guides not just the physical growth, but also, you know, policies related to the social aspects of our community, our economy, all that kind of big picture items. Um, Traditionally, comprehensive plans or master plans, as they're sometimes referred to, have really been rooted in the future land use. So they really grew as a tool when um, communities had land they were expanding into and trying to identify how that would be used moving forward. So in communities like ours that are already established in terms of our boundaries, we don't have anywhere we're looking into, comp plans have really grown to include a lot more um, engagement to gain consensus on kind of paths and policies moving forward outside of just physical development. So we'll go through that. So establishing the, the comprehensive plan really gets rooted in Missouri statutes. So I kind of bolded a few of the key terms related to the comprehensive plan and where, where how it's established. So within the Missouri statute, it's it's a city plan for the physical development, but it also talks about surveying existing conditions and thinking about the probable future and growth of the community. So there's basic elements of a comprehensive plan outlined in these statutes that we will include, but it doesn't limit us from expanding beyond that physical development um, role. And then really relating back to that general welfare and how we wanna develop our community. When we look at the city charter, a lot of the language you see here that refers to planning and zoning, creating of the plan commission and this plan is, is almost identical language to what you see um, within the Missouri statutes, which really, again, align this plan with the responsibilities being the plan commission as the adopting authority. One of the, very, one of the areas that our city charter kind of varies from those Missouri statutes is it talks about presenting that plan to the board of aldermen for approval. But because of how this, the state charter or the state statutes are set up, really it's the plan commission has the authority to approve that. And then to be kind of in line with our charter regulations, we will present that adopted plan from the plan commission to this board, but more in a, in a, a presentation mode and not in a way that you would then make changes to what has been adopted by the plan commission. So what do we look for in a comprehensive plan? Some of the language you'll see on the screen here is pulled directly from our request for proposals. So really, when we think about the, the big picture of where our community is headed, we think about the different aspects that influence how our community is for people that live here or work here or own property. So we're thinking about our economy. We think about the natural environment, stormwater issue, sustainability, um, the built environment. What's that physical atmosphere that we walk around in? Our regional context is really important here in, in the St. Louis area. So what's our kind of role within the region and how does that regional context influence what happens within our boundaries? And then also that social environment, what makes people want to spend time in the community. So when we look at our actual plan content, one thing that has changed since previous um, proposals to do a comp plan for the city is outlining sustainability and equity guiding principles. There's a there's a variety of ways that communities um, will organize their plan. I think based on a lot of the conversations that have been coming out of some of our subcommittees, the way that we decided to establish it within our um, RFP is early in the process, really defining what 
uh, guiding principles are in terms of equity and sustainability related to our community, and then use those principles as a lens for reviewing and setting priorities in the larger categories of our physical development, our um, economic policy, our transportation analysis, all of those community elements that are outlined below, as opposed to having future land use and then a separate section on sustainability because there's so much overlap within a lot of those categories. The community needs assessment. That's kind of a more of a moment in time look at a market analysis. So what are kind of our demographics? How do we spend money? What are potential gaps or types of businesses maybe that we could support here? Mention the existing and, and future land use transportation network analysis. Um, that will overlap a little bit with our livable communities plan, which is looking at pedestrian and, and trails. And then a big one is the performance management and implementation part of the plan. That's where we'll actually identify some the path forward. So now we've set the policy kind of guiding principles. How can we start to work to implement and get there? So that leads us into really... Um, an area that sometimes can be a little bit confusing is the difference between planning and zoning. So the comprehensive plan, again, this is our policy direction. This outlines our goals and our vision, whereas the zoning, that's an actual tool for implementation and enforcement. So that's really a mechanism that would come after our guide is set up within the plan document. Then we look at our tools, how we're enforcing projects moving forward and update that. So thinking about the downtown master plan, an example was uh, creating that Maryland Gateway District. So we identified a vision for a specific area and some key actions that relate to that vision. Then the result in our actual implementation tool was creating that Maryland Gateway overlay, which is an actual enforcement mechanism that we can use to directly influence projects. Um, and so we have really updated that within the downtown master plan for a specific area, but it's been a really long time since the city has looked at uh, as the city of a whole in terms of that guiding principles and where do we need to update some of our codes um, and influence different areas, not just our, our downtown. So who will be involved? This is probably a question that a lot of people are curious about. There's a few different kind of larger categories of that, the consultant team. So that's uh, a team that will be selected through the interview process that will work really kind of hand in hand with staff to make sure that elements of the plan um, are created to kind of meet minimum standards that they're included. The consultant team will really be the ones that are responsible for drafting the plan language, the content that goes into it. So they'll kind of work on that document um, and, and we'll be able to choose them through our interview panel process. The steering committee is really a big representative and we'll go into them a little bit more in a few slides, but they're really the, the community representation that will stay constant throughout the entire process. So they're providing guidance and feedback and they're gonna be representatives of really hopefully a variety of stakeholders within our community. The public is incredibly important to successful comprehensive planning. So we really need to make sure and we'll work with the consultant team to make sure that we're approaching the public in different avenues. When we think about Clayton, um, we have residents of all ages and types. We've got property owners, but a big part of what makes the Clayton community are the people that come here to work, the people that come here to spend their time at our restaurants, the businesses that choose to locate here. So that's another avenue that uh, a lot of times more standard traditional comprehensive plans focus on the, the residents and the property owners. One thing we need to make sure that we're doing within our comprehensive plan is also engaging some of those, those other people that might not live here full time, but are really important to the, you know, the success of our commercial areas. That include the county. They'll be in, they'll be invited to participate. <laughs> yep. So the planning commission, as I mentioned before, within the statutes for the comprehensive or for the the planning document, they're the adopting authority. So they're rarely involved in the process. And in another side, we'll kind of break down how they'll be involved in different elements. Um, but ultimately, they'll be the ones who will review and adopt our comprehensive plan. And then you all, the board of aldermen. Um, will be presented that plan after. So it'll be important for you all to continue to be involved throughout the process, um, making sure that people come out to participate in the, in the different engagement activities that we have, providing feedback. You can provide feedback through the process and intend, 
attend events as well, um, but you aren't a little different from a lot of the, pro the projects that come before you, you aren't that ultimate adopting authority of this plan. So that your participation throughout will be slightly different than with a PUD where ultimately you have the adopted authority over that development. Okay, so going into the steering committee just a little bit more, really the roles of the steering committee fall into two main categories. The first being that the steering committee is really the representation of our community interests and our stakeholders. Um, so relaying information back to the groups that they represent, um, encouraging participation from different community members, being that link for the consultant team and staff that might not have direct people to reach out to and some of the, the groups that we want to make sure their feedback's engaged, and then attending events. So that category of really helping to make sure that we get that public feedback and the message is important. And then the second role is guiding staff and the consultant team. So really commitment to attending the meetings. The, the steering committee will be kind of that you know, first, you work to make sure that everybody comes to the engagement meetings, then staff and the consultant team kind of take the feedback from different various, you know, meetings or events or surveys or what it might be and evaluate what that is. And then the steering committee provides feedback. Yep, it sounds like that's a, a good um, interpretation of the feedback received at engagement or not, and then also providing feedback as we look to draft priorities. So there's going to be tons, when we talk about engagement of the comprehensive plan, it's touching a lot of aspects of the community. So a big part of Right. Just, let me just reshare my screen here. Okay, so what do we look for in steering committee members? So uh, again, building on the commitment, really we need uh, representatives who are gonna attend these meetings. That's the really important way to make sure that we're providing the right direction to the consulting group. Another big one is really the passion for the direction of the community. So you want to be involved with the future of what the community is, since this is a, a policy document that's driven towards the future. So I put this graphic from an earlier slide back up here. So when we think about what is influencing and making up a community, we want to think about representation of these different aspects and, and look at residents, businesses, like I talked about before, professionals that might be in a few different categories that have kind of training and knowledge about different aspects that are important to a comprehensive plan, um, institutions that are a part of our community. So as much as we can, when we're establishing um, and solidifying who's on the steering committee, we wanna try to get a variety of representation through that. So in our first discussion, um, with the plan commission, we kind of presented this idea of what the structure would be to support that. We're looking at a, a nine member group for a steering committee. We think that's a, a good number to provide some variety and representation, but also uh, a number that's easy to manage in terms of gaining a consensus, scheduling and ability, other things like that. So three members will be representatives from the plan commission. Then we'll have a representative from sustainability, one from equity, and another one from the school district. And then the last three members will be at-large community representatives that we aren't going to restrict what it means to be a community representative at this time. It will um, hopefully help us fill out the steering committee with other representative groups. So for existing commissions and committees, those um, or those entities will be involved in selecting and letting us know who the representative will be. So sustainability committee will determine who their representative for the steering committee is. Staff's not going to choose a representative from them or from planning commission to participate. 
And then for the three at-large community representatives, we're really going to essentially use an application or an interest form. So community members will be able to submit themselves as options for these at-large members. And a few reasons why we want to do that. One, again, we really want people that are committed to this process in the future and, and providing feedback. So this will allow them to present themselves as people who are willing to make that commitment to be engaged, but also it will hopefully allow us to um, again, at the end, make sure that we have those various representatives when we look at how to fill out our steering committee structure. The plan commission then will serve a few different roles. So one of them is providing the three members to serve on the steering committee. The other three members who are not serving on the steering committee will then kind of run our interview panel, so to speak. So there'll be representatives along with a few staff members that will interview the different consultant teams to ultimately select a consultant. And there'll also then be the, the three that will review any of the interest forms that we receive from at-large community representatives to select those three at-large members that will then serve on the steering committee as well. So it, we're kind of separating the, steer, the plan commission throughout the process to kind of spread their influence. The city manager will really operate as a, as a member of the staff during this process. So when we think about that relationship with the consultants, it's a really important one for staff to be going back and forth with. So um, that's where we'll have and the city manager. And then when everything comes back with a draft plan to be presented to the plan commission and ultimately adopted, that's when then we'll work back with um, the plan commission in a whole, everybody there in their, their typical roles. So I did a that really good question. I, can you, um, I'm not sure I totally understood the statement city manager will act as a staff member. What does that mean? So the, like, as opposed just, to, <laughs> right. So that just means that during, um, basically we split the six members of the plan commission into either on the steering committee or part of the interview panel. And then the city manager is the seventh member of the plan commission won't serve. Okay. That's yeah. So, so David will be part of the interview panel kind of as a part of the staff group and will be part of the ongoing working group with the consultant, but won't serve on the steering committee. So that's kind of how it will be a little bit different from the other plan commission members. So overall, the process um, started December 5th or 14th when we posted the request for proposals. So those are due by February, end of day, February 1st. Um, we've had a handful of kind of questions about responses to that, so hopefully we'll we'll get a good um, number of, of responses by February 1st. Uh, then that's kind of when we'll open that commu at-large community representative form to start gaining interest um, from different representatives. And then early February is when we'll solidify that interview panel and start uh, going through and selecting the consultants that we would like to actually interview and the interviews will take place end of February might spill over into March, depending on the scheduling of those. And then March would be when we would determine who our consultant is and go through the process of negotiating contracts and getting that all that set with the goal of starting our plan in April. So once that plan starts in April, we would also have to have the, the steering committee set because they'll start meeting on some sort of regularly scheduled meeting times. Then engagement will be settled exactly what that looks like based on who we choose as our consultant, but it will likely involve aspects of you know, the website and presentations and surveys and events, whatnot. Um, and we expect this process in total with the consultant to run probably a year, um, maybe a little bit longer, depending on the timeline of events for actual adoption with the public hearing requirement. Um, but the plan should hopefully be completed within a year. And then the public hearing and adoption would be at the plan commission. And then we'll also make a presentation to the board of aldermen after that. All right, that was the highlights of the summary. Very good. Great summary, sure. great presentation, lots of information. That's really great. Um, we'll just go around and see if anybody has questions. Rich, any, anything that you wanted to ask? Um, I guess the only question I have is in the um, steering committee, uh, it's, it's kind of hard with only nine people to get a real... Uh, Cross section of everything, everybody. Um, I guess the couple one couple that I'm 
curious about our business. You, you mentioned the business community being uh, one of the stakeholders. Um, are they available to offer their services as an at large? Yes. Okay. Um, how about students? Since I see we probably have a few. Yeah, that's a, a good point. So the nine is not a number that we have to be stuck to um, based on the responses. So that we kind of talked about that. The planning commission had the same um, question. So once we start to see the the members kind of form and what interests we're getting with that large form, we can always add uh, more members to make sure that we're including everyone. The student one is interesting. We've been having a lot of um, with with the rest of the department conversations about how we can intentionally engage students at different levels from elementary school through but because when you think about a comprehensive plans looking typically 10 20 years in the future so at the end of if we've implemented all of these goals of the plan the people that are living in the community in terms of working here and owning property are the people that are currently in school so it is really it, it will be important and that's also why we wanted to specifically invite a school board representative to be on the steering committee to hopefully help create more of a link to get engagement from those groups. Thanks. Ira, Ira, do you have some questions for Anna? I, I do, just a couple. Um, Anna, has this, is this sort of a model that's been done before in Clayton or in other cities? For the steering committee? Right. Yes, um, typically comprehensive plans of this nature will have a formula, a steering committee, advisory committees, you know, some insert name. Um, yes, so usually we outline when um, from the past when on the private sector side working on these, we want to identify who those stakeholders are and then hopefully round out that group. So that's why we, there can be flexibility in that nine target number. I think nine is kind of our minimum number that we want. Um, but it usually works well to have a solidified steering committee with intentional and in, in inviting different groups to participate in it. So, so, because it, it, it seems like a, a daunting task um, when you're talking about stakeholders, if you, if you, if you want to put on somebody from the business community, we don't know that they'll be here in 10 years, right? Or 20 years. Uh, we don't know if any, any of our residents who might be on it will be here in 10 or 20 years either. Um, and so it's like, uh, you know, is there any way to figure out who might be more likely to be remaining as a resident or remaining as a, a business operator in the city? I, I, I would just say, um, I think that'd be tough, Ira, yeah. especially residential, yeah, but, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of business, I mean, we have some major if we want to go that route, we have small businesses and then we have major corporations and I'm not sure, although anybody can be sold, right? But mm -hmm. let's just give an example, something like Commerce Bank, you know, if they had a person they wanted to offer up, you know, I mean, th that would be a more, less risky in terms of long-term, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right. I, <laughs> You might imagine, Ira, that someone who self-nominates for a planning process like this and feels engaged and listened to during it is even more likely to still be here in 10 or 20 years than, than some of us. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, good point. Okay, that's it. I just was curious about how we're gonna put that together, but I guess it'll be a process. Uh, Bridget, any questions? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we... I. We, I talked about this a lot at planning commission. I'm also kind of worried, obviously, about getting a full cross section. One of the things we talked about related to getting the business community was I know Gary Carter meets with a group of people, you know, who obviously have shown a lot of interest in being involved and in communicating with the city. So making sure that they're aware of the um, application that goes out to the community at large, and hopefully we'll get somebody to respond and really be involved. Are you talking about the Economic Development Advisory Board? Yeah, and I know he just meets, or you, you, you and Gary have met with people. So just knowing, making sure that they're aware that there right. is this application out there. Um, and then, Anna, I, I, I guess I don't remember this, but the three other members from the Plan Commission that aren't on the steering committee, are those three alone going to select the community representatives, or will they get some input from others, or? 
the way we talked about it and have it right now is that those three alone would be doing it. It wouldn't be a staff decision um, or influence, but obviously we're here to provide help and guidance for this planning process. So, I, you know, we wouldn't leave your own advices if, if needed, but ideally in this setup, it would be those three that would review it. Um, and then I was also, one of the things we talked about too, is just making sure that that the people who are chosen from the like sustainability and equity and the, um, you know, that there's, um, that we kind of know who those people are before we start picking out the community at large representatives, just so that we're getting a diverse cross section of ages, males, females, you know, everything. So, but. okay, Susan, uh, questions? Uh, it was an excellent presentation. And I've, in my, one observation is is pretty much the same, making sure that we get that representation on the steering committee. And a lot of that depends on how it plays out as well as the community engagement afterwards. But um, nine does seem, when you listed all the voices that we actually need, and including allied universities to what everyone else was saying with businesses, and, the, and those will be here for the long haul. It might be tough to make sure that we have all the voices we need in that in nine people. So, um, but it, it depends how it all plays out in, in the other engagements. Becky. Thanks, Anna. Um, I would just think it's, um, it would be great if we had so many people apply with such diverse backgrounds that we um, were able to expand the steering committee but and still have it be manageable. So that would be a great thing. And to keep in mind that the engagement is going to be focused to ensure that we're engaging with each of those groups like directly or and that they all have an opportunity to participate in everything. So, and I think what you pointed out is the responsibility that really we all have <clears throat> to communicate on this to our constituents and neighbors um, so that we ensure that people know about it um, and can participate. Um, my only question is on the engagement. Um, understanding that we are going to be going through the pedestrian and bike planning process at the same time, I, I believe, are those going to be distinct plans, like separate consultants, right? Okay. Correct. Um, and so I imagine you all are thinking about how to manage that, like those two major engagements at the same time. I don't know what, if you can talk at all about what you've thought about that to date and how you yeah think we've, we can make we've it had work. some internal um, discussion I think a lot of that will be some staff leading to making sure that we're updating each other and we've also talked with um, with Gabby and marketing about how to make sure that the message is clear and make sure that we don't have conflicting events for engagement um, so I think through some of these channels we'll be able to do so but it will be an important part about making sure that we choose the right consultant to, um, to make sure that they are open to those types of processes and having things change or maybe hosting joint events that would you know, be engagement for the livable communities and ours. But we definitely want to make sure that the, the plans align with each other uh, and there aren't any conflicts and that we're reinforcing kind of the same goals. So we'll, we'll, it'll, it'll be something that we'll have to just keep an eye on as the process goes. But I think ultimately it, it won't have any negative impacts on either plan. Thanks. Alderman Fader. Uh, just as an aside, I'm teaching a class this uh, week at Washington University Law School, a one week class on commercial real estate. And I invited any of my students who wanted to see local government in action. So two of the students are here. So <laughs> what if you were wondering, those are two of my students. In May, we, I did say we also had a seven o'clock meeting. So. A couple, couple more may wander in. Um, just a comment uh, on the representation. It does occur to me we probably don't want to expand the committee, but if we're looking at the business community, the Chamber of Commerce obviously represents a wide variety of businesses. And as the mayor and David know, because they come to the same meetings I do, the Chamber has a <laughs> monthly meeting, a legislative committee meeting, and a lot of those people, I think, are very interested in legislation like this. And so even if it's not a member of the steering committee, some way to reach out to the chamber uh, to see if there's some way to involve them in the process that might be a very direct way uh, to try to get some input. And my, my question really for Anna was, I'm, I'm trying to understand at the end of this process, since the plan commission 
is ultimately not the implementing body for a lot of things, particularly rezoning, creating new districts. I'm wondering is the level of specificity you're looking for from the plan commission in terms of recommendation, would it reach the level of, you know, hypothetically taking this part of Clayton and rezone it, the recommendation from R1 to R2 or vice versa? Is it, or is it more conceptual and it's still up to the Board of Aldermen to decide how to implement achieving that goal, assuming it's the right goal? Uh, I think the implementation strategy will have a variety of levels in terms of what the actual steps to achieve the goal and the vision will be. Um, the When it comes to the rezoning or the establishment of a new zoning ordinance, I think that that's typically a follow-up to any new comprehensive plan of this level is a more widespread analysis of our zoning code. So those types of aspects are directly and related to the plan commission's roles and responsibilities. So that's kind of probably has a lot to do with why the statutes outline them as the adopting authority in this um, case. But uh, I think there'll be a variety of, uh, of looking specifically at districts. And you know, we talk about the use of overlays in the downtown and then we look at some of our other commercial nodes throughout the city, the secondary ones, you know, why down Hanley and other areas where there aren't overlay districts, but they, I think um, within the comprehensive plan, looking at those as maybe sub areas would likely happen with more detailed analysis. Um, why down Hanley comes to mind as an easy one because there's existing provisions of the code that really directly conflict with the uses you see there, such as residential <laughs> being allowed above um, uh, retail and restaurant uses is not allowed in the C1 district, but we, that's pretty much what Wide on Hanley is. So that's like a low hanging fruit that I would expect something to be noted in a comprehensive plan as a goal of removing those conflicts and barriers. But then there's going to be larger, more conceptual ideas, especially as we look at our guiding principles of what equity is, what sustainability is to our community. That's where this comprehensive plan offers an opportunity for really widespread engagement to understand what those terms mean to us. That would be a lot harder to maybe achieve that widespread engagement on just, just the equity commission alone mm -hmm. trying to achieve it. So that's kind of where this plan will cover a variety of really targeted implementation steps and then more guiding conceptual principles. Thank you. Well, I just have a couple of questions. Well, one is a question, one's comment. So the on the guiding principles, um, that's really that's a really critical part of this whole thing, getting it started. And so how will those principles be developed? Who will develop those? And how and will there be public engagement around those then once there's some initial ideas or Yes, there will be public engagement. So usually the first kind of phase of these comprehensive plans is really data gathering and analysis. And so some of the initial conversations that we can have through that are creating the, the interactions that would start to have the conversation where people feel start to feel comfortable answering some of those tougher questions that communities have to face. So that first phase will be important. Maybe in the eight, in the end of it, we won't know exactly the, the wording of our principles, our guiding principles for equity and sustainability, but we're at least, um, the goal is to at least establish those relationships where people start feeling comfortable having those conversations. We'll have, have kind of a, a general idea of where we're headed. And then that will allow us to make sure that our more specific engagement throughout the next few phases of the project will allow us to dig in a little bit deeper to establish, use those as a lens when we're looking at really specific land use policies or more specific questions related to access and transportation elements. And then ultimately in the draft of the plan, the final kind of end stages is when the wording will probably more be flushed out specifically for those. And there, there really isn't any uh, formal process for the board to give input on those. It's just if we happen to be in the audience during public engagement or something like that. Right. I don't think uh, through the public engagement, you'll all of the even the steering committee meetings, those those are open meetings. So if you're not a member of the steering committee directly, you, you, know, you can still be there and hearing participating in terms of listening in on the meeting. But um, I don't think there there's going to be anything through the process as specific of us necessarily putting up a, a sentence and then gaining feedback on the wording of that. You know, that's more kind of the end of the process. When we look at the draft plans, the steering committee might provide some feedback at that level, and then it'll be presented to the planning commission. But you all are welcome to participate and should participate in all elements of the public engagement 
um, throughout that entire process. So there's, even though you're not the adopting authority, it, you, there's, there's opportunities for you to still participate as an important part of the public and ultimately an important part of the policy side of the city. Right, okay. And then my comment just is um, based on our experience with waste collection and people ability to learn about it or, or you know, the success of our public awareness campaign. <laughs> um, I, I, I would love to see like the, your plan is for getting the word out on this because it, it's, it's I, I can see obviously you want to engage a broad, a broad scope here of our, our of all kinds of stakeholders, all kinds of cohorts. And I think it's very hard to get people to be aware, engage. Are you going to have an online uh, uh, a tool for people to um, engage with and give input on things that are discussed in, in the meetings? Um, I just think the outreach, it has to, it, I mean, I, I'm getting in the weeds, but we need to put signs up, you know, yard signs all over town. Or, you know, people just aren't paying attention and that's okay. But, you know, we really want that input so that when we get down the road at Hanley and Wydown, whatever we start trying to do is not met with. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, you're that's correct. Absolutely. The A lot of the details of that planning will be something that will be worked out with the consultant team that we choose. That's part of, you know, what, when we interview them, getting an idea of how they've been able to achieve that kind of outreach success with a variety of groups. So right now I can tell you exactly what it would look like, but we have started conversations with Gabby, understanding the the bang the table aspect of our website and other elements of it to make sure that we're prepared to have those conversations with consultant to ultimately outline a good path forward for engagement. But it will when you talk about a, a community, especially people who've lived in a community for a long time, engaging them, everyone has their kind of method of how they get the data, the information from the city. So some people, you know, they look for the city views mailing and that's how they get their information for a few months. Some check the website on a regular basis. So we're going to definitely have to utilize all the platforms available to us to make sure that we're reaching everyone. It's going to be, it's going to be hard. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments or all right, very good. We can thank you, Anna. That was great. And um, we can move on to the, the Maryland bike lane. All right, so that's the second conversation here is the bike lane review. Um, so I'll go through this report just a little bit. I know everybody had an advance and then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, but we've had the bike lanes open on Maryland just over 14 months. Uh, and we did say that after a year of use, we would come back and have this conversation and talk about how they're functioning. Uh, so we'll just offer up a few observations uh, that we've made over the past um, 14, 15 months. There have been no reported accidents or incidents involving pedestrians, cyclists, or vehicles uh, within or as a result of the bike lanes. So uh, Chief Smith and the police department went back through all the reports uh, over that period and could not find anything um, in their system related to the bike lanes, which is good. Um, and then we made some anecdotal observations. So the lane reduction on the westbound side of Maryland, and this is one of the, the big concerns you hear out there, uh, it's appeared to result in slower traffic flow overall. So if you travel that on a regular basis, uh, we we certainly have observed that it's moving slower uh, than it did before the bike lanes were there. Uh, while there has been no degradation of service, so um, we haven't observed people waiting for multiple lights uh, over and over again as the results of the bike lanes being there, if there's a delivery truck or you have somebody that's not very good at parallel parking, maybe that's going to take multiple um, attempts in order to park their vehicle within that travel lane, uh, that could certainly impact the flow of traffic. Uh, but the bike lanes themselves, reducing it to just that one lane, um, absent a delivery truck or somebody trying to park, traffic is still flowing through that section of Maryland Avenue. Uh, we have the bollards that delineate the bike lanes from the lane of travel for vehicles. And those are an operational burden for our staff. Uh, they have to go out and, and manually remove all of the bollards uh, when the winter comes because uh, we can't plow snow uh, to the curb if those, those bollards are there. Uh, and then when spring comes around, we go ahead and put them back out. Uh, but when they are out, we can't get a street sweeper all the way up against the curb. So I know we got, uh, we did receive a, a couple of concerns uh, just about the leaves and, and the sort of debris that accumulates uh, within that bike lane. So that requires us to go in manually again 
uh, with leaf blowers or, or other tools uh, in order to clear that out. So um, that is one of the drawbacks of having the bike lane delineated. The reason those are there and the reason they're effective is, is what we saw back um, uh, when the bike lanes were initially installed, uh, which was the delineators came out after they had been in about a month or so. Uh, and then we had people parking up against the curb instead of parking in the designated spaces. Um, so they were parking in the bike lane essentially and blocking that, uh, that path. We passed that ordinance that prohibited parking within a bike lane. And that's something we've enforced on a regular basis. Uh, we also had a lot of public education and then additional signage along the bike lane. Uh, and our observation since that time is that that condition has improved. And if you drive down the street now, uh, you know, the bollards are out and you'll see that people are parked in the correct spot. So that's something that just uh, took some education over time and, and people doing it and getting used to uh, parking in a new area. Uh, and then finally, we don't have an accurate count of cyclists utilizing the bike lanes. Uh, again, anecdotally, um, I've observed people riding them. I've, I've ridden them, you know, ridden in the bike lane. Um, personally, I know people have utilized them. We don't know to what extent that's occurring, though. We don't have a, a formal count at this point. Uh, so as far as the, the traffic counts, though, uh, on Maryland, uh, we probably won't do that again until all of those lanes are, are restored, uh, not just on Maryland, where we have the bike lane that's uh, currently interrupted at the Bemiston Place development, uh, but also uh, we need foresight to be open because Forsyth lane closure associated with the Forsyth point development is definitely sending more traffic uh, over to the Maryland side. So we need to get a real true count of what the traffic flow uh, and the traffic count on Maryland is. And until that construction uh, is complete, that's going to be difficult to do. Uh, we also have the whole uh, element where uh, office occupancy is of what it was prior to the pandemic. So uh, if all of the offices were back at 100% occupancy, uh, that would certainly increase the flow on Maryland, and we're not sure how that would impact or how the bike lanes would impact that with the single lane of travel uh, when you go westbound. So that's something we're going to have to observe going forward. Uh, so staff's recommendation at this point in time is just to continue to monitor the bike lanes uh, and also have a broader community discussion through that livable communities master plan, which is coming up. Uh, so we are going to be discussing uh, bike and pedestrian facilities and the network itself. Uh, so there's certainly going to be more conversation on that, but at this point in time, uh, we can't find any uh, real detriment uh, that's impeding traffic or causing a safety concern uh, where we would recommend a removal at this point in time. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll open it up to uh, you and the board. Absolutely. And then we do have our Director of Public Works, Matt Malik, is here tonight, along with Chief Smith from the Police Department. Okay, guys, any comments? Rich? Um, my only comment is I, I would like that if we are not going to do anything that we make sure we've communicate that we've looked at it and for the reasons you've cited, we are keeping it as is. So I, I, we said we would do, look at it after 12 months. We ought to say that we did look at it and we're not going to do anything right now, at least. We've got a city views coming up. I know that because I have to write something. Uh, it's due in a week or so, so we could put something in that. I I, I can't think of a, a really better way to uh, let people know. I mean, unless anybody else has ideas, okay. that'll come out in the spring. Okay. Uh, Ira, any comments, questions? Yeah, I think City Views would probably be the best way to let people know that we've done the annual review uh, <laughs> and we've come up with the best uh, uh, answers to the questions that most people have. Uh, and I think that's fine. Um, and I think it's uh, important to, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, this question about, about use, I think is something that the public keeps wanting to talk about, or at least make comments about whether they're anecdotal or, or anything else. And, you know, I, I just want to make a comment about this on the record that as far as use goes, I know it's being used, I see it, but, but, but I don't think that really is the, the, the major crux of this because if you have a bike lane that we, this is our first real bike lane downtown, we don't have any, you know, we haven't done any um, adding to these, this in terms of connectivity and creating something bigger out of this. And so I, I, I appreciate what David put together in terms of his list. I think it's a, it, these, are, these are good answers, good questions to ask and good answers to those questions. Um, I'm just not particularly interested in how many people are using it at this point. 
So that's my comment. Good. Yeah, Bridget. Um, I, you know, I think the um, observations by staff were good. Um, I, I myself am on Maryland many, many times. I don't, I'm probably, I would guess from the people in this room, I am on Maryland the most, um, just given my trips to and from school and the center and um, I'm on Maryland constantly. <laughs> um, Chris even sent me because it drives, you know, the traffic lights and stuff, you know, which again, keeps traffic slow, but um, Chris, my husband, like it makes him crazy, but um, although he loves the bike lanes, but um, I will just say, I think, I think the observations really are good in terms of understanding, because we really don't know what traffic's going to be like um, once we kind of uh, get all the lanes back from Forsyth. I know getting to the high school has been a nightmare this fall. And I know a lot of parents have been moved to Maryland in order because you literally couldn't get down Forsyth. And there was a line all the way to almost Forest Park Parkway um, to turn left into the high school <laughs> when those lanes were closed. So um, I just think there's a lot going on before we start making any um, big decisions about Maryland. Um, I will also say, I just want to reiterate too, what the bike lane has accomplished is I, unlike many people's observations, I do consistently see people using this bike lane. Um, and also it is accomplishing the fact that people don't, people can't drive 40 miles an hour down Maryland anymore. They can't. Um, and that's a good thing. You know, um, I will say the uh, wonderful woman who owns Happy Up actually says that because people drive slower, they can actually see her shop a little bit better now. So, um, so for all those reasons, and just, you know, I think it will be important as people have already mentioned um, the communication because I, um, Gary and I constantly get communications from our residents asking about the evaluation of this. So I think it'll be important to communicate that. Yeah, good, I agree. I don't have much to add. I think it's a, uh... It's a very good step for our community and the connectivity I are you're right as things develop more uh, we will really we'll really see it and as as the city settles into a some type of norm as well so the, the publicizing that and that it ties into the livable communities the bike and the pedestrian study I think is 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 great makes sense. Becky comments yeah I supported this bike lane as a resident before I was on the board and um, I use the bike lane and I think it's great. I'm pleased that we um, are seeing use of it in these general positive um, impacts. Um, and that's all, thanks. Alderman Fader. Oh, yeah, I would echo the idea about the communication and I think we might consider, I'm not a communications person, but this is one of those things where like a Q and A approach might work well because we all hear the same questions over and over again uh, and to be able to address the question directly as opposed to a narrative that just says mm -hmm. this is what we're doing but something that addresses the questions um, but I think all this makes a lot of sense as recently as at the last meeting I went to about the apartment project someone stopped me and said I, I wish I had a buck for every time I've heard this you know it's an accident waiting to happen well, I mean, the reality is, and I respect people's concerns, but the fact is, accident hasn't happened. I mean, that's the point. I mean, the facts speak for themselves. We haven't had accidents. I understand why people are concerned, but I think after 14 months, I think those concerns, I think, have been adequately addressed. And certainly, there's lots of reasons not to do anything different now. But we have to keep assuring the community, because there are people who care a lot, that we're going to continue to look at this very seriously. But to do something about it now doesn't make any sense. We should explain what we're talking about tonight in some cogent form to the public so they know what's going on. We can like to clarify that most of the comments that I hear are very positive and not a lot of discussion, just like, you know, it's, it's a good thing that we're getting, we're getting to this stage of the city operations. Yeah, things so. are certainly getting better in terms of comments. Can I, Mayor, I'm sorry too. I just want to clarify too, and maybe Chief could help with this. Um, because we get communications all the time from residents about the bike lanes. Somebody did contact Gary and I that there, I think there had, we, there was an accident in the bike lane. I don't think there was any physical injuries, but I think there was some damage to a car. It was back in September, Chief. I don't. I, 
I think, no, I think it was a bike and an automobile. And I only say that because the res resident who contacted us specifically. Yes, we, we, heard, said, we heard about it. Yeah. We did so, it. and I don't, I don't, I know that there weren't any injuries, but just so that, you know, it doesn't come out that there was Fully nothing. It sounds like there was something back in September. Um, so, but. Might have been on next door, by the way. It was on one, it was on some communication. It was, I thought it was a weekly report. Maybe yeah. that, Somewhere I mean, there was yeah, one report. Officers, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Just good. in case. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything to add. I agree with what everyone said. And um, I do think, you know, the bike, having bike lanes in our business district, if possible, makes us, you know, more welcoming. And that's one of our overarching goals because we're trying to provide activities for people that are young and for families. And we, we want to we wanna be that city. So um, I agree, we don't have much connectivity, but the, honestly, that's not really our fault. So we need to, I, I do remind our other mayors nearby that they need to connect to us, um, but, but it does connect to the uh, Great Rivers uh, Greenway, you know, path. So that's good. And um, we will see, we'll, I look forward to seeing, you know, how the community engages around this during that bike peds planning process. I think that'll be really enlightening. So I think we'll hear a lot more positive things then, than at least I hear now. <laughs> so, all right, great. Good, thank you. Um, we have a few minutes until seven. And so we can just take a break and do whatever. And um, we'll reconvene right at seven. I mean, like, that seems like something that you know, might be really open
The Gary Postpius response. Yes. Here. Thanks, Gary.
We're still broadcasting. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to our seven o'clock portion of the meeting here tonight. And uh, we'll ask the city clerk to call the roll. Alderman Lentz. Here. Alderman Berkowitz. Here. Alderwoman McAndrew. Here. Alderwoman Buse. Here. Alderwoman Patel. Here. Alderman Fader. Here. Mayor Harris. Here. City Manager Gibson. Here. City Attorney O'Keefe. Here. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to call for the approval of the minutes from December 13th and need a motion. I will move to approve the minutes from December 13th. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Very good. And now's the time on the agenda for public requests and petitions. So if there's someone in our audience, either online or here, that has comment or question about something that's not covered in this agenda, um, now's your chance. So I'm looking to see if any hands are raised anywhere and I don't see any. So we'll, we'll move on to the public hearing for renewable energy. Thank you, Mayor. This is a public hearing to consider amending Article 28, Renewable Energy Systems of the City's Zoning Regulations to revise the location requirements and create an administrative review process. In May 2022, the City Sustainability Committee drafted a recommendation to the Plan Commission and Architectural Review Board to consider changes to the renewable energy system regulations to allow for expanded installation of solar panels. Multiple discussion sessions have been held since then to gather feedback and direction of potential modifications. The following goals have guided the amendments drafted by staff. First, to expand opportunities for installation of solar panels and other renewable energy systems to further the sustainability goals of the city and community. Secondly, remove barriers for installation of renewable energy systems that conform to standard criteria by providing a path for administrative review and approval. And third, identify historic context considerations and additional criteria for review to ensure continued protection of neighborhood and architectural character. The plan commission considered this request at its meeting on December 19th and voted unanimously to recommend approval. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the amendment as proposed. Uh, we do have Anna Crane, our Director of Planning and Development Services here this evening to answer any questions, uh, but I did receive one question uh, in advance of the meeting from Alderman Fader, uh, just about the different approval types that are contained within the Perhaps orders. Perhaps I should open the public hearing Let's do that well too. and request proof of public hearing. There we go. All right, so um, there are really three different approval types that are contained within this ordinance. The first one is an administrative approval. So that's essentially a staff review. And if the application meets all the requirements in the regulation, uh, then it's approved. It doesn't have to go on to any boards or anything beyond that. Uh, then they, we go into the permit issuing process. So for an administrative review, uh, we will do that for residential ground mounted and building mounted uh, energy systems. So solar panels uh, on a roof of the building, uh, for an example. Also non-residential building mounted uh, systems. So solar panels on non-residential buildings are also subject to administrative review. The second level is an ARB review. And for an ARB review, uh, there's a section in this ordinance that talks about alternative compliance. Anything that would fall under that, anything that kind of falls into a gray area or there's question about it, uh, ARB would actually step in uh, and take the review at that point in time. Staff also has the ability during one of those administrative reviews to refer the matter to architectural review board. So if there's something unique, if there's some sort of question as to the application and whether or not it meets the requirements, uh, staff could trigger that, um, uh, that review by ARB. And then finally, projects with historic context. So the final section uh, that's in the proposed ordinance talks about historic context uh, in kind of the uh, uh, what constitutes historical context. So if it's a building that's listed on the National Register, if it's within a National Register district and it's a contributing structure, in those particular cases, ARB would need to do the review. Finally, there's a conditional use process that's spelled out uh, in this ordinance, and that applies to non-residential ground-mounted units. So if you have a commercial property and you want some sort of um, solar panels that aren't affixed to the top of the building, but maybe they might be out in a, in a required front yard or in the rear yard, wherever, 
Uh, if it's on a commercial property, it has to go through the CUP process. So that would be the plan commission or ARB and also the board of aldermen. Uh, and the same is true for wind energy systems. So this ordinance does allow uh, wind energy. However, any application for that has to go before the board of aldermen. Uh, so we have an administrative process, we have an ARB process, and we have a CUP process, depending on the, the type of application. And all of, that, all of that is spelled out in the ordinance. Very good. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up now for discussion. Any questions or comments from the audience here or online? See no hands. Any questions or comments from the board? Rich, we'll start with you. Nothing? Ira? Okay. Bridget? Uh, was Ira? Oh, oh, no. Here he is. No. Sorry, Ira. Not so no good. questions uh, or comments? I, I, no, I don't have any questions or comments. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I was just going to make a comment, you know, just with respect to the um, approval process through staff. So at ARB, we approved, because this wasn't in place yet, we approved some solar panels on the top of the new Bank of America building. Um, so, which is fantastic. They're yes. doing it all around the country. The gentleman who was on the phone doing it was talking about how he's going from place to place. Um, so that's fantastic. But in the future, um, staff would be able to do that without it coming. So I think it's you know, I think it's uh, um, everybody at the plan commission was really supportive and um, I'm just really excited that we'll be able to get this through quicker um, at the staff level and then if necessary, um, you know, it can come before the before ERB, but I thought Anna did a great job. Yeah, very good. Great. Isn't any comment. I just want to commend the sustainability committee and the planning commission and everybody who worked on this and, and getting it done because as, as you pointed out, it's it's time and it's happening anyway, and this will make it much more streamlined and effective. Alderwoman Patel, anything? I'm just going to pile on because I really appreciate, um, you know, I mean, the sustainability committee didn't know like how this should be done. They just knew that it was consistent with like what we value and want to see more of and want to make it easier for people to put on solar panels. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate the way that Anna and her staff approached this. And because um, I think anything we can do to ease the process for our residents to invest um, in their homes in general, and specifically when it's sustainable like this or innovative, that's awesome. Good work. Gary. Um, yeah, my only comment, I think David's explanation of these three levels of review is very helpful and is very helpful tonight, but it's not very helpful to the extent it's not reflected in the ordinance anywhere. It is, of course, if you read through it, you, you get there, but I would think, to, not to impose on it to think about it, but I would think a very simple chart that would say, you know, these are the three levels of review and this is what triggers each one of these for those who want to use the ordinance in the future, I think it would be very helpful to have something like that. Uh, I, I, I certainly think it would it would make it easier. And, and the other thing that, and I think David and I talked about it, as, as I understand, typically when things go through the ARB, that's the end of the process. The Board of Aldermen does not get involved, except if there is an appeal. And it seems to me, particularly as this thing sort of works its way through, it's not inconceivable that we might have somebody who's a homeowner who doesn't like the placement of a, a particular solar panel and at least would like to have the right to go forward and appeal that. And as I understand it, in fact, that right is there because where this, where this is in the ordinance, there actually is an appeal process. Um, it's just not in this ordinance, but it is part of the broader zoning section. So I think it's important somehow to convey as this thing gets rolled out that there still is an appeal process if a homeowner is unhappy with an ARB decision, it would go under the right circumstances to the to the board, to our board, uh, again, under certain circumstances. So I think we just want to make that clear to uh -huh. people that that appeal right is still there. Yep. I, great point. Um, we can do that, I'm sure. Yes, yeah. we, we can do that. We also um, are in the process of updating it. We have a lot of, on our website, different kind of submittal guides based on different topics. And with our uh, new online platform for submitting permits, we're updating those guides to align. So 
um, and talking with what you're mentioning, not being in the ordinance about what type of project and what type of process it might go through. I think we can cover that in, in the updated guide related to renewable energy applications, as opposed to putting it within the, the actual that'll, code. That'll work as well, sure. Very good. All right, anything else from anyone? No. Okay, um, I will now close the public hearing. Alderman Lentz. I'll introduce Bill 6934 to approve an amendment to Chapter 405, Article 28. Get that right. Uh, renewable energy systems to allow for expanded installation of solar panels to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? All right, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6934, first reading, an ordinance amending. Chapter 405, Zoning Regulations, Article 28, Renewable Energy Systems, to revise locations for energy system installation, establish an administrative review process, and other modifications related thereto. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, very good. I'll move that the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6934 on the day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, let the minutes reflect. The board is given unanimous consent. And I'll introduce Bill 6934 to approve an amendment to Chapter 405, Article 28, Renewable Energy Systems, to allow for expanded installation of solar panels to be read for the second time by title only. Second. All right, any discussion? Okay, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6934, second reading and consideration for adoption. An ordinance amending Chapter 405 Zoning Regulations, Article 28, Renewable Energy Systems, to revise locations for energy system installation, establish an administrative review process, and other modifications related thereto. Alderman Lentz. Aye. Alderman Berkowitz. Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Buse. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. Mayor Harris. Aye. Thank you. All right, moving on, I will open the public hearing and request proof of publication for the chapter 425 sign regulations. Yes, Mayor, this is a public hearing to consider amending chapter 425 sign regulations of the city's land use regulations to reorganize sign types by zoning district, clarify definitions and sign allowance and other modifications. Over the years, case law has shaped how signs are regulated. One of the more well-known decisions being Reed versus Town of Gilbert in 2015, which struck down the sign code as being content-based and therefore a violation of the First Amendment. Since then, many communities have uh, taken to rewriting sign codes to remove content-based regulations. Staff has rewritten sections of Chapter 425 to remove content-based regulations. The proposed regulations do not significantly modify the sign types, sizes, or locations that are currently allowed but rather reorganizes the code to align with current best practices. The proposed regulations create consistency throughout zoning districts and will help contribute to a certain character and support necessary wayfinding and messaging. The proposed regulations also provide for clarity in how sign areas are calculated and determined. Diagrams have been added to section 425.020 definitions to show how the calculation is applied to different building sizes and layouts, as well as different sign shapes. Many traditional sign regulations measure sign area using a rectangle based on the height and length of the sign. The proposed regulations allow for the sign area to be measured using the boundary of a sign for various shapes, which can encourage creativity in shapes while maintaining a standard size allowed. The plan commission considered this request at its meeting on December 5th and voted unanimously to recommend approval. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the amendment as proposed. All right. I'll open the discussion. Any questions or comments from the audience? All right, seeing none, I'll move on to the board. Uh, Rich, any questions, comments? Um, no real questions. I just think this is great. This is, this, signs were always uh, confusing when they came to the ARB, so I'm, I think clarifying it is terrific. Thanks. Very good. Ira, any comment? I, I, I concur. Uh, with my fellow alderman on the confusion and the difficulty in dealing with uh, signs at ARB. And I think uh, this, I welcome this, uh, this clarification. Thank you. Anything no comment. No. Thanks, Anna. Susan, any comment? 
Good work, thank you. No comment. No comment. Alderman Fader. All good. Okay, very good. I will then close the public hearing. I'll introduce Bill 6935 to approve an amendment to Chapter 425, sign regulations of the city's land use regulations to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? All right, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6935, first reading, an ordinance amending Chapter 425, sign regulations to reorganize sign types and regulations by zoning districts, clarify definitions and other modifications related thereto. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. I'll move that the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6935 on the day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Let the minutes reflect the board has given unanimous consent. Then I will introduce Bill 6935 to approve an amendment to Chapter 425, sign regulations of the city's land use regulations to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6935, second reading and consideration for adoption. An ordinance amending chapter 425 sign regulation by reorganizing sign types and regulations by zoning districts, clarify definitions and other modifications related thereto. Alderman Lentz. Aye. Alderman Berkowitz. Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Buse. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. Mayor Harris. Aye. Thank you. Okay, moving along. I will open the public hearing and request proof of publication for honeymoon chocolates. This is a public hearing to consider an application for a conditional use permit submitted by Cameron Loyette of Starry Night LLC doing business as Honeymoon Chocolates to allow for the operation of a 2,500 square foot cafe with an outdoor dining area. Honeymoon Chocolates will be open seven days a week from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. The cafe concept is dessert-based to serve drinks and food that incorporate or pair as well with the chocolate created in-house. The applicant has also applied for a liquor license. The cafe will have 40 seats and will continue to operate the existing outdoor dining area. The proposed cafe is located within the existing retail chocolate shop. Off-street parking is not required for restaurants located in the Central Business District, measuring less than 3,000 square feet. Deliveries will be made in the morning via street parking in front of the restaurant. The restaurant will continue to use the existing recycling and garbage pickup services. The Planning Commission considered this request at its meeting on December 5th, 2022, and voted unanimously to recommend approval as requested. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a conditional use permit for the operation of Honeymoon Chocolates, located at 16 North Central, Per the conditions outlined in the resolution, and the applicant, Cameron Loyette, uh, appears to be online. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Cameron, are you with us? Yes, yes, I am. Okay, great. Well, this is a fun, sounds like a fun, exciting new business for us. Um, can you kind of give us sort of the concept of what you're, what, what, you know, what it's going to be like? You bet. So um, as, as it stands now, we manufacture chocolate sweetened with honey. Um, we've been selling throughout the, the country and throughout the, the world. We're in seven different countries right now, sold with our, our chocolate that's all made here in Clayton. Um, but we want to expand to have more of a footprint here in St. Louis. So doing so through either pastries, um, um, alcoholic beverages like a, a chocolate martini um, or wine and whiskey pairings, uh, partnering with some some local distilleries like Switchgrass Spirits um, is, is our goal with, with this particular conditional use permit. That sounds great. And I'm, I might have missed it, but when are, when are you thinking of uh, opening? So we're, we're open right now, yeah. but I, I would when still, are you thinking I would of love, converting? Yeah. I, I'd love to convert for, for Valentine's Day if, if possible. Sounds like a plan. Okay, great. Well, we're excited for you and um, thanks for coming to the meeting and listening. And I'll ask uh, the public if there are any questions, comments, and any questions or comments from our board. Uh, yeah, Ira? I'd, like, I'd like to say that I've been over there a bunch of times. Cameron is a, a, a wonderful person to talk to, but his, his product is fantastic. It's a great, it's a great product. 
you all ought to go over there. He's got a nice, uh, nice restaurant, nice uh, indoor area to sit and uh, and and enjoy the enjoy the chocolates and, and some ice cream as well. So, I uh, I think it's a great addition to the city. So, thank you, Cameron. Wonderful. Anything, Bridget? Anything over here? No. Okay. Very good. All right. Everybody's excited. Thank you again. And I will close. Well, chocolate. I, what? Everybody wants chocolate. Everybody loves chocolate. Yeah, you know, really, you should have come to the meeting and given us some, <laughs> given us some samples. But there'll be more meetings that you could come to, so that's good. Um, <laughs> all right, um, I will close the public hearing then. And um, Alderman Lentz, I'll move to approve resolution number twenty twenty three dash oh one, granting a conditional use permit for Starry Night Cafe LLC. Doing business as Honeymoon Chocolates at 16 North Central Avenue. Second. Hey, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, very good. Thank you. And we can move on to the city manager's report. Yes, Starry Night, Starry Night Cafe LLC doing business as Honeymoon Chocolates is requesting a liquor license to sell all kinds of intoxicating liquor at retail by the drink, including Sundays at 16 North Central Avenue. The police and planning departments have completed a review of the application and support issuance of the requested license. The applicant has chosen not to submit a petition from surrounding property owners and first floor tenants. As a result, they are aware that this application must have a supermajority vote of five board members in order to be approved. Staff recommends passing a motion to approve the liquor license to sell all kinds of intoxicating liquor at retail by the drink, including Sundays. Okay, I'll open the discussion. I don't see any hands online. Anybody here have questions or comments? Okay, very good. Alderman Lentz. Uh, I'll move to approve the liquor license for Honeymoon Chocolates at 16 North Central Avenue. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Very good. And moving on to the marijuana tax, Mr. City Manager. Yes. On November 8th, 2022, Missouri voters approved an amendment to Missouri Constitution relating to the legalization, regulation, and taxation of marijuana. Section 2.6, subsection 5 of Article 14 of the Missouri Constitution authorizes the governing body of any local government to impose an additional sales tax and an amount not to exceed 3% on all tangible personal property retail sales of adult use marijuana sold in the political subdivision in addition to any and all other uh, retail sales tax allowed by law if approved by voters of the political subdivision. The attached ordinance calls for an election for Clayton voters to consider an additional local sales tax of 3% on the retail sales of adult use marijuana sold in the city. The proposition known as Proposition M would be placed on the April 4th, 2023 ballot and would read as follows. Shall the city of Clayton be authorized to impose an additional sales tax and an amount not to exceed 3% on all tangible personal property retail sales of adult use marijuana sold in the city? Staff recommends approval of the ordinance. Very good. All right, I'll open the discussion. Any questions from our audiences? Okay. Uh, Alderman Lentz, I mean, yeah, Alderman Lentz, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Do you have any comments or questions? I don't. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Ira? No, no. Glad, no. glad we're doing it. Okay. Um, I, I guess, you know, we don't have any dispensaries in Clayton, but, you know, we might. Um, is there any, are we going to do any sort of PR effort? I mean, I'm not suggesting that we spend a lot of money sending anything out, or are we just hoping that it, there'll be enough interest? I mean, I, I think a lot of other communities are doing this. So just assuming that maybe word of mouth will, sure, I, our, I know, our residents will <laughs> know. Right. And I, I know we had interest as far as uh, medical dispensaries, none of that materialized. The next step in this process is for us to go through our offenses section uh, and also our zoning code to make sure that those are uh, all up to date. So you'll be seeing more legislation come forward. Uh, but as far as uh, dispensaries, I mean, it's, it's on the approved, you know, use list. So I'm sure there will be some interest out there. And if we certainly got a dispensary, then, um, you know, we would hope people would utilize it and, and pay the additional 3%. So. Well, I think, you oh, know, just okay. like when any, when we put anything oh, on the, the tax proposition, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. 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 As far as the tax proposition goes, I think everybody is is putting this out there. So we'll communicate that it's going to be out there. 
of course, we can't put things out to go ahead and support it. Uh, but I think every city around us, for the most part, is going to have this on the ballot as well as um, I'm sure the, the county will have something on there as well. So yeah. it'll be out there. And everyone has named this across the state, Proposition M. Uh, so there's consistency there as well. Okay, okay very good. Uh, let's see. Any other comments or questions? I was going to ask how the how it got named. You got to choose that. You basically answered. <laughs> That's exactly right. We so some, we get to. There ask. was a lot of conversation yeah. throughout the state, and then the Missouri Municipal League put out a recommendation that everyone use proposition right. for exactly that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Very good. So, any other discussion? All right, Alderman Lintz. I'll introduce Bill 6936, levying an additional sales tax on sales of adult use marijuana and calling for an election for voter approval to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? Okay, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6936, first reading, an ordinance levying an additional sales tax on sales of adult use marijuana and calling an election for voter approval of such tax. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. I'll move that the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6936 on the day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, let the minutes reflect the board is given unanimous consent. Then I'll introduce bills 6936, levying an additional sales tax on sales of adult use marijuana and calling for an election of, for voter approval to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Any discussion? City Attorney. Bill number 6936, second reading and consideration for adoption. An ordinance levying an additional sales tax on sales of adult use marijuana and calling an election for voter approval of such tax. Alderman Lentz. Aye. Alderman Berkowitz. Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Buse. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. Mayor Harris. Aye. Okay. Um, Mr. City Manager, the IT agreement. Yes, this is a contract renewal for technology services to be provided by the City of Clayton to the City of Brentwood on a contract basis. The previous three-year intergovernmental agreement for technology services uh, expires as, uh, expires on February 1st, 2023. We have developed the attached renewal agreement that outlines the services to be provided by Clayton and the cost to be paid by Brentwood. Under the current agreement, the city of Brentwood pays 35% of Clayton's total cost to operate our IT department. Since the start of the current agreement in 2020, in 2020 we have tracked our activities and spent um, and time spent supporting each city. Uh, we, each, we also provide uh, this particular service to the city of Richmond Heights. This data was taken into consideration, and this new agreement will lower the fees that the City of Brentwood will pay to 31%. We have also budgeted a small contingency for unknown items, which may come up throughout the year. The approval of this agreement will initially extend our technology services contract for an additional 18 months. Upon expiration of the initial term, this agreement will automatically renew for an additional three-year term with fees being reassessed at that time. The City of Brentwood will have its first reading of this agreement at their January 3rd, 2023 meeting. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the attached ordinance authorizing the city manager to enter into an intergovernmental agreement, with the city of Brentwood for Clayton to provide technology services. Uh, and the other thing I'll point out with the, the partnership with Richmond Heights is right now Brentwood and Richmond Heights have contract terms that don't match. Uh, and the way the formula is set up is basically the three cities split the cost of those services. The intent of the initial 18 month period is to get Richmond Heights and Brentwood on the same contractual schedule so that if one of these cities was to make a material change that would change the cost for the other cities, we can talk about that, negotiate it, and also get it approved at the same time. So if you're wondering why we have a, a, a strange 18 month initial term, that's the reasoning behind it. Okay. Very good. I uh, can open the discussion. I see Larry is here if you have questions for him. Uh, so I'll start over here. Um, yeah, I guess I have a the question I have is if we're splitting this somewhat evenly, um, but it would it, it would surprise me if all three cities had exactly the same needs um, on their technology at any one time. In other words, their 
um, systems are all being renewed or some system being renewed one year versus another year or another period. So I guess I'm just, how do you get that all to even out? Uh, but overall, it um, it evens out in the end as far as system upgrades or system implementations or audio video uh, implementations in the council chambers. It, it sure. evens out. We we track all of this in a few different places. We have our own time management system where we track exactly what we do each day in what city uh, we spend our time in. Uh, our project management platform, we use SharePoint, we go back by, you know, city by city, see how much time we're, we're spending there. And then our help desk system, we can see who's putting those calls in and uh, who's taking up our time. And, and you're right, not each city requires the same amount of our IT staff. It's heavily weighted towards Clayton. Clayton has more users. Clayton has more technology than the other two cities in that's why I believe Clayton is around 45% uh, is what they pay for out of the operational cost of our department right currently. And what David said about the code terming is really helpful in that regard because what we found ourselves every time these would renew, they would possibly change by a few percentage points one way or another, but it left the other two cities to make up the difference. And so now that they're all renewing at the exact same time, we can right size those costs uh, across the board. Great, thank you. Ira or Ira, any questions? I don't. I don't. We've done this before many times, and I, I like the fact that we're doing it. It's, it's, a, it's a good program. Thank you. Yeah, we began supporting them in 2017. Uh, mm -hmm. So six years as we're going into our seventh year with the city. Brentwood specifically, and I feel it's been pretty, um, it's been mutually beneficial to all part, all participants, including the city of Richmond Heights. Mm -hmm. Right. Just, oh, yeah, Larry already uh, answered my question. Yeah, okay. All good, thank you. Um, is this the amount that they pay us, is it based on a fully loaded uh, cost? fully loaded, I, you know, all the benefit, all the total yeah, comp yeah. and so forth. Yeah, when we figure it out, I worked with finance. This this past agreement was with Kayla. I worked and we, you know, we consider all operational costs from benefits, salaries, um, even down to laptops and cell phones and our vehicles and mileage that we reimburse and everything else. Uh, we try and think of every operational cost that we have. And that's also why it, I forget which page it is on that agreement. There's an overhead piece that is usually three oh. to 5% overhead. And that's to cover cost. That's hard to quantify like our office space that we're, but we're trying to uh, make up for that and that overhead piece, things Very like good. that. Okay, good. That's great. All right. Um, I don't think there's any further questions right. for you. So you can sit down again. Um, Alderman Lentz. I'll introduce Bill 6937 to approve the renewal of an intergovernmental agreement to provide technology services to the city of Brentwood to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? City attorney. Bill number 6937, first reading, an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Brentwood for the city of Clayton to provide technology services to the city of Brentwood. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I'll move the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6937 on the day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, let the minutes reflect. The board is given unanimous consent. I'll introduce Bill 6937 to approve the renewal of an intergovernmental agreement to provide technology services to the city of Brentwood to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Any discussion? All right, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6937, second reading and consideration for adoption, an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement 
with the city of Brentwood for the city of Clayton to provide technology services to the city of Brentwood. Alderman Lentz. Aye. Alderman Berkowitz. Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Buse. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. Mayor Harris. Aye. Thank you. Okay. The lockers at the outdoor pool. Yes, the Shaw Park Aquatic Center was renovated in 2003, at which time new lockers were installed in the locker rooms, pool deck, and the lifeguard office. These lockers are approximately 20 years old and in need of replacement. In some cases, the lockers are missing doors and hinges, hinges are failing, both of which use parts that are no longer available for repairing the lockers. Approximately 88% of the current lockers in each locker room measure 12 by 12, and all lockers on the pool deck are 12 by 12 as well. Staff often hears from users that the size is too small to store their belongings. In addition, each public locker requires a fee of 25 cents per use. Due to the cost and inconvenience, many participants simply leave their belongings on the pool deck or in unlocked lockers. Staff agrees that a phenolic, I, I guess is how you say this, I'm going to say it's a plastic-like material. Yeah, there we go. With a keyless lock feature is the best solution for lockers at the Shaw Park Aquatic Center. The material is more durable than metal lockers in a pool environment, and a reconfigured layout will provide better size lockers uh, for storage. In addition, each locker offers a, either a combination code that can be reset with each user uh, free of charge or the ability to bring your own lock. Grid is the provider of these lockers with keyless entry in the St. Louis area. They also participate in SourceWell, which is a nationwide purchasing organization for public sector procurement that offers an extensive portfolio of solutions and partnerships. As a result, they have provided a bid for the project, factoring in a 20% discount from the normal price of their products. The full project scope includes removal and disposal and disposal of the existing lockers in the locker rooms, pool deck, and lifeguard office, as well as installation of the new lockers in these areas. The project should take approximately one to two weeks to complete. Funding for this project has been included in the city's ERF for 2023 20, uh, in the amount of $81,600. The total cost of the project will be $73,817. It is recommended that we include a 5% contingency of $3,690 to be used to cover unforeseen expenses. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve an ordinance allowing for the purchase and installation of new lockers at the Shaw Park Aquatic Center through GRID and the amount of $73,817 plus a contingency of $3,690. And Tony Searing, our Director of Parks and Recreation, is here this evening if you have any questions about the project. Very good. All right, we'll start over here and open the discussion. Any questions for Tony? Ira, questions? Well, um, I don't, we covered it last night on Parks and Rec, so I, I don't have any questions here. Okay, very good. Tony, I was just going to ask, are the lockers going to be different shapes like they are at um, the center? Yes, they will be different shapes. They'll be larger. So there will actually be fewer of them, but um, they're not being used as frequently, but they will be a better size that you can fit an actual bag in as opposed to trying to cram something in a 12 by 12 box. But will the, all the lockers be uniform in size? Or will, yes. Yeah, so yeah, sorry. Yes. Like at the center. Okay, great. And yes, this is... They are in bad need of replacement. Yeah. Good. Any, any, uh, I had, I had one more. I did have one more question, uh, Mayor. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, Tony, do you know, I mean, I, you know, the, the prior lockers that or the future prior lockers uh, required a, a 50 cent payment for the use of the lockers, correct? Uh, it was a quarter. A quarter, even. Yes. Do you happen to know on any annual basis? What, what we actually did receive from those quarters? I do. Um, it's been getting less and less over the last uh, several years, and it's less than $200. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah I'm fully <laughs> it used to be quite that. quite a bit more than that, but yeah, it's it's not substantial. <laughs> Had you considered yeah, no. a price increase because no. they're new? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're really trying to um, encourage people to lock their valuables. So we're giving them the either combination code or there's some that you can put your own lock on, but we, we want to encourage people to secure their belongings. <laughs> yes, I, I understand. Yeah. So All just right. to be clear, there will not be a fee to Correct. Use. It'll be like Correct. at the center. Yes. Yeah. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other discussion or questions? I just want to say, I, I, I really like your thinking on this. This is really a smart way to go. So I appreciate you. that. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Tony. Okay, Alderman Limbs. I'll introduce Bill 6938 to approve the purchase and installation of lockers at the Shaw Park Aquatic Center to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? City Attorney. Bill number 6938, first reading an ordinance authorizing an agreement for purchase and installation of lockers at Shaw Park Aquatic Center. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I'll move the board give you give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6938 on the day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Let the minutes reflect the board has given unanimous consent. I'll introduce Bill 6938 to approve the purchase and installation of lockers at the Shaw Park Aquatic Center to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Any discussion? All right, Mr. All right. City Attorney. Bill number 6938, second reading and consideration for adoption, an ordinance authorizing an agreement for purchase and installation of lockers at Shaw Park Aquatic Center. Alderman Lynch. Aye. Alderman Berkowitz. Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Buse. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. Mayor Harris. Aye. Thank you. Okay. All right, Mr. City Manager, the Police Department Training Room. Yes, this project will construct a permanent on-site training space for the police department to conduct training exercises at 10 South Brentwood. The design of the space, which is located in the lower level of the police building, was coordinated between the police department and public works facilities division in 2022. During design, there were modifications made to enhance the functionality of the space for conversion to use as a classroom setting, as well as modifications to the HVAC system that added to the estimated cost. Two bids were opened on November 14, 2022, and Pinnacle Contracting submitted the lowest responsive responsible base bid in the amount of $98,213. This project was placed on hold temporarily due to COVID in 2020 and was funded in the fiscal year 2022 budget at $84,000. The increase in construction prices uh, has resulted in an overage. Therefore, an adjustment to the fiscal year 2023 budget may be requested to cover the increase. Uh, so that's something we'll monitor as we move forward. This is contained within the capital improvement plan. So we'll see how other projects, uh, if there's savings and, and we can make up the difference there. Uh, if not, this will be part of a future budget amendment. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the ordinance authorizing a contract with Pinnacle Contracting for construction of the Police Department Training Room in the amount of $98,213, plus a contingency of $10,000 to cover expenditures to correct unknown issues that become apparent during the project. And Chief Smith is here to answer any questions you have about the project or the facility. All right, I'll open the discussion <coughs> and I'll start over here. Any questions? Is the, I guess I'm confused about how the training room works as a classroom. Is it, does the training room have equipment in it and that has to be moved in order to make it into a classroom? Yeah, so it's going to be an open floor with mats, kind of oh. like rusting mats on it. Okay. But we're, we're also going to be able to roll those mats out, roll them up, and then move desks in there and seating. Uh, we, we plan on hosting training with other agencies. Okay. That's one of the things, bring instructors in and for um, the uh, defensive tactics type training we, we utilize. We also have that simulator now, and uh, that'll be down in that room as well. So, the, so that's, I guess that's what I was thinking, is that the, the bigger equipment, like the simulator, aren't isn't going to be in the way of the of the classroom. It's just yeah. The, the, the simulator is just a screen with a, a projector and this computer attached to it. Okay, that's going to be easy to move, move out of the way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Ira, any questions for Chief? Yeah, Chief. Um, <clears throat> so was there not a we did, we we didn't have a training room? There was no facility at the department for training. I mean, no, there wasn't one. Uh, uh, put into our current station. So we um, we used, we're currently using a an unfinished room. We're, we improvised and found an unfinished room. Unfortunately, it's next to Larry's office. And so the walls are pretty thin and he hears all the grunting and yelling and the, the, during the training. So th there's that issue. Also that, that uh, current room doesn't have electricity in there. We have to run cables out the hallway for the simulator. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it was, it's an unfinished room that 
um, nobody found a use for um, when we moved into our current location. Okay, All right. thanks. Good, good question. Bridget, anything? Susan, Becky. Question I'm comment? just glad we're getting you a room that is more suited to um, your value and skills. Sure, thank you. <laughs> well said, Alderman Thader. I enjoyed my, my, my tour of the facility in the past and I've, I've seen the space you use and so I'm, I'm sure you need a new one. So I'm excited Sorry, you're gonna get it. That's right, you got to see the, uh, the simulator, is that correct? And all that? Okay. That's great. Okay, um, I would just say, if anybody would like to experience the simulator, it's very fun and a little scary. Uh, you should take the Citizens Academy police training I probably have the title of that wrong. Well, it's the Citizens Academy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You should you should do it. When when is the next one? Uh, we run that from September through November. Okay, so you have time to think about it and get up your courage. Yeah, it's great. All right. Um, moving on then, um, Alderman Lentz. I'll introduce Bill sixty nine thirty nine to approve a construction contract for the police department training room to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6939, first reading, an ordinance approving a construction contract with Pinnacle Contracting Incorporated for the Police Department Training Room. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I'll move the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6939 on the day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. I'll let the minutes reflect the board is given unanimous consent. I'll introduce Bill 6939 to approve a construction contract for the police department training room to be read for the second time by title only. Any second. discussion? Oh, sorry, we did that simultaneously. Okay, uh, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6939, second reading and consideration for adoption, an ordinance approving a construction contract with Pinnacle Contracting Incorporated for the police department training room. Alderman Lentz? Aye. Alderman Berkowitz? Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew? Aye. Alderwoman Buse? Aye. Alderwoman Patel? Aye. Alderman Fader? Aye. Mayor Harris? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Finally, we are getting to the fire department. Um, Mr. City Manager. <laughs> All right. The station alerting system is designed to utilize the digital data signals from the new computer aided dispatch or CAD system at East Central Dispatch. Prior to any audible tone, a digital data packet will be sent to the fire station to pre-alert and dispatch crews. The system segregates alerts from, for the ambulance, ladder, engine, and chiefs. Recently, East Central Dispatch has updated their CAD system. With this, upgrade, with this upgrade comes the ability for new technology for receiving the request for emergency services. The information received from dispatch will be in a computer-generated voice tone so the firefighter is able to hear and understand the information being relayed. The fire station alerting system allows for an automated dispatch message and the selection and generation of tones is also an automated process. Overall, the automated system reduces the reliance on the primary fire dispatcher to select the appropriate tone and verbally announce the call for service. Through the equipment replacement fund, $110,000 has been budgeted for this project. The cost of the hardware and installation in this contract is $108,646.65. Staff recommends that the ordinance be approved. And Chief Rhodes and other members of the fire department are here this evening if you have any questions. Glad to see you all here, by the way. Glad you came. Um, yeah, anybody, I'll go around. Any questions Question. for the chief or anyone else? No, no. Ira, questions? No. No questions. Okay. It looks like a slam dunk then. Uh, uh, Alderman Lentz. I'll introduce Bill 6940 to approve the purchase of the fire station alerting system to be read for the first time by title only. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. I'll move the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6940 on the day of its introduction. Second. My turn. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Mr. City Attorney. Number sorry six. we skipped you. Oh, that's all perfectly all right. 
<clears throat> Bill number 6940, first reading an ordinance approving an agreement for purchase and of a fire station alerting system and installation thereof. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Now I'll move the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6940 on the day of its introduction. And I'll second it again. Oh, good. <laughs> all, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, let the minutes reflect the board is given unanimous consent. Uh, I'll introduce Bill 6940 to approve the purchase of a fire station alerting system to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Discussion? Okay, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6940, second reading and consideration for the adoption an ordinance approving an agreement for purchase of a fire station alerting system and installation thereof. Alderman Lance? Aye. Alderman Berkowitz? Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew? Aye. Alderwoman Buse? Aye. Alderwoman Patel? Aye. Alderman Fader? Aye. Mayor Harris? Aye. All right, done deal. Uh, Mr. City Manager, the CCF MOU. Yes, the City of Clayton has an agreement with the Clayton Community Foundation, or CCF, that went into effect on April 27, 2010. It was subsequently amended July 12, 2016, and again on March 23, 2021. The current agreement contains a funding provision stating that CCF will be expected to incur 75% of all costs associated with the administrator for fiscal year 2023 and 100% of all such costs thereafter. The restated agreement being considered this evening would provide for continued contributions from the City of Clayton to the Clayton Community Foundation through fiscal year 2025. The requested contribution would be approximately $50,000 in fiscal year 2023 and is projected to increase by 3% annually in both fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25. Half of the contribution would go towards the executive director's salary for work performed solely for the city. This would include 10 hours of work per week related to research, grant writing, involvement with the Hanley House or other special projects. The other half of the contribution would go towards operational expenses such as insurance, service fees, utilities, supplies, and licenses. No portion of the contribution would be directly utilized for the solicitation of donations to CCF. Section 8.3 is also new to the agreement and clarifies the roles of both entities. Staff recommends approval of the attached ordinance and Alex Elmstead, executive director of CCF, uh, appears to be online. Okay, very good. I'll open the discussion. Uh, Alderman Lentz, any questions or comments about this? Uh, no, I think it's a, a good move forward. I like the fact that we've got an end date to separate them. So, uh, and I and I feel good about the way it's we've separated and delineated the, the roles that Alex is going to play for for the city. Ira, question yeah, comments? Yeah, it's a reasonable request. I um, you know, I just think look at the history of CCF and and our relationship with them. And I, and I think, you know, as a fledgling, uh, I think the city participated quite a bit uh, more uh, in in the in their operations. Um, and I think that that has become less and less and less uh, over the years. Um, and so, you know, I think this is a, a reasonable request and I'm, I'm in favor of it. Bridget, anything? Yeah. No. Okay, are we here? Go ahead. Great. Well, yeah, I just wanna say thank you to the CCF for all the work they do on behalf of the city, uh, enhancing our city. A lot of things we have in place would not be possible without their hard work. And so um, I'm happy to support this as well. And so, um, Alderman Lentz. I'm pleased to introduce Bill 6941 to approve amending and restating the memorandum of understanding between the City of Clayton and the Clayton Community Foundation to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6941, first reading an ordinance approving an amended and restated memorandum of understanding between the City of Clayton and the Clayton Community Foundation. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, very good. I'll move the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6941 on the day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, let the minutes reflect the board is given unanimous consent. 
And I'll introduce Bill 6941 to approve amending and restating the Memorandum of Understanding between the City of Clayton and the Clayton Community Foundation to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Any discussion? City Attorney. Bill number 6941, second reading and consideration for an adoption. An ordinance approving an amended and restated Memorandum of Understanding between the City of Clayton and the Clayton Community Foundation. Alderman Lentz. Aye. Alderman Berkowitz. Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Buse. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. And Mayor Harris. Aye. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. City Manager, Bill number 6942. Or... Yes, it is the last ordinance of the evening. At the Board of Aldermen meeting on September 27th, 2022, the board approved ordinance number 6775, approving a memorandum of understanding between the City of Clayton, the International Association of Firefighters, Local 2665, and the Eastern Missouri Coalition of Police, Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 15 for specified pension enhancements. The enhancements include a one-time backdrop, which is a deferred retirement option program, a forward drop, and the purchase of military service credits. Per RSMO 105.665, the city engaged the services of Buck, the plan's actuary, to develop a cost statement for the proposed enhancements, which was available for public inspection for the required 45-day period. Under the current plan, the anticipated employer cost on January 1st, 2023 is $738,818, which is 9.84% of covered payroll. With the enhancement, the anticipated employer cost on January 1st, 2023 is $800,054, which totals 11.15% of covered payroll. This results in an increase in total employer costs of $61,236. A 10-year employer cost uh, was provided in the packet. Staff recommends approval of the Uniformed Employee Retirement Fund plan restatement and inclusion of the one-time backdrop forward drop and purchase of military service credits and to the Uniform Employees Pension Plan as drafted by the city's pension plan attorney. Uh, the one thing I would point out is we, we talked about it being cost neutral quite a bit. Uh, the one thing that this doesn't capture while we talk about the cost is also the associated savings with this type of program. Typically, or actually in order to be eligible, an employee would have to be here for a, a long period of time. Uh, those employees are typically at the high end of your pay scale, and then when they take the drop, when they elect to do that and, and uh, retire at that point, that position is backfilled with somebody that's at the beginning of the range, which results in savings. So that additional um, $61,000 that we anticipate for this year, if we have uh, individuals that utilize that backdrop, we will actually... Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> The web's doing the math. All right. Uh, but we should be able to, to recover um, a lot, if not all of that amount, uh, just through that attrition. So just wanted to point that out. Uh, and we do have Karen Dilber in case there are any questions, oh, yeah. our Director of Finance online this evening. Okay, very good. I'll open the discussion and I'll go around. Uh, just like to say that I know this has been going on for a long time and I'm glad we're finally getting it done. Alderman Berkowitz. Same here. Yes. Any questions, comments over here? Yep. Okay. Very good. Well, I'm, I just want to say we, we appreciate all the hard work that you guys do every day. And um, we're, we're thrilled to give you the benefits that we are able to. And um, I'm glad, again, glad you came to uh, visit our meeting. Yeah. All right. Um, no further comments, Alderman Lentz. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Bill 6942 to approve the Uniform Employee Retirement Fund Plan revisions to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? City Attorney. Bill number 6942, first reading, an ordinance amending the City of Clayton Uniformed Employees Retirement Plan and Trust by including a one-time offering of a backdrop deferred retirement option program a forward drop and a purchase of military service credits and approving a restatement of the pension document. All right, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Sorry, any opposed? Let the minutes reflect the board is giving unanimous, no? You don't need that yet, in a minute. Oh, oh. 
We said all those in favor. I'll first, okay. I'll first yeah, go move, ahead. First move. Board Sorry. give unanimous okay. consent. I'm skipping. I'll move that the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of Bill 6942 on the day of its introduction. All those Second. in favor. All those in Aye. favor. Aye. Aye. Sorry, there's a delay here. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> let the minutes reflect. The board is giving unanimous consent. I'll now introduce Bill 6942 to approve the Uniform Employee Retirement Fund Plan revisions to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Any discussion? City Attorney. Bill number 6942, second reading and consideration for an adoption. An ordinance amending the City of Clayton Uniformed Employees Retirement Plan and Trust by including a one-time offering of a backdrop deferred retirement option program, a forward drop and, a pur and purchase of military service credits, and approving a restatement of the pension document. Alderman Lentz. Aye. Alderman Berkowitz. Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Buse. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. And Mayor Harris. Aye. Thank you. All right. Last but not least, a motion for our dispos disposal of records. Yes, it is the recommended guideline of the Secretary of State to formally approve the disposition of records at the Board of Aldermen level and to include a list which describes the, the record series, including quantity to be disposed, the manner of destruction, and the destruction date. A list of records from the Fire Department and Planning Department was included in the packet. Based on the board's past discussion, staff has reviewed the records and confirmed that these are material that these uh, materials meet the retention schedule set forth by the Secretary of State, and that these records are no longer needed by staff. We have also verified that this list does not contain any records we would consider to be of a historical nature. And following the board's request that a method of disposal be procured that assures maximum security and confidentiality of the records, the city has arranged for a company to come to City Hall and shred the records on site. This will occur in a timely manner upon approval of the motion by the Board of Aldermen. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a motion to dispose of the records as listed in conformance with the Missouri Secretary of State General Records Retention Schedule. Very good. I'll open the discussion. Any, any discussion? Have we ever had a request for something that we've already destroyed? Uh, no, but we've had a request for um, something that was destroyed in the tornado, during the tornado uh, a few years ago. Oh. We had off-site storage out in Earth City, uh -huh. and that building that it was stored in was destroyed, and so we had records. Yeah, interesting. Many years ago, we accidentally destroyed some historical stuff that certain people wanted, and yeah, yeah but... That's long, long behind us. Ira, any questions? I, I'm, I'm imagining that we have less and less to destroy, right? Are we going more and more paperless, especially in our uh, yes. planning department? Yes, all of our permitting is now online in the, the planning department. Uh, so we've been, we've been pushing people that way since the, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so that creates a, an electronic file, which is great. There's still some requirements for hard copies, and we'll continue to comply with those uh, those regulations, but as soon as um, uh, those records no longer need to be kept, we can dispose of the paper copies and retain the digital files. Uh, same is true with, with public works where a lot of that has gone online. Uh, so everywhere we can um, go to online permitting, we're making that move. Uh, and we've actually had it implemented now for uh, going on three years. So uh, we should get to a point, I would think in about five years or so, uh, where all of those records will be kept digitally. So anything we're getting rid of, uh, with as far as paper copies, it's, it's not going to matter so much. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Susan? Questions? Second? Gary? Seems to be a hand up on the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, all right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Berland, would you, do you have a question for us on this? Yes. I was wondering what the cost was. The cost for the, the shredding? Yeah, for the shredding and the, the approval. Yeah, how much this for shredding? You mean or it's associated with this uh, disposal of records. I don't know if it's simply the shredding, or if they have to be stored or whatever. Right. Is there um, is there a cost associated with that? And what yes, it was, Mr. Berlin. There is a cost associated. Um, we don't have that cost until we know how many boxes. Um, that we have, they go by boxes and um, barrels because they'll empty the the boxes into the 
the uh, containers and then shred them. So it's per container. Okay, so is there any idea of the range? Are you talking about? Um, it could be, it can range from $42 per container. No, I, I understand that, but I'm talking about the, the, the item. Uh, several items have come up tonight and there hasn't been a budget uh, connected with them. Uh, the lockers at the pool and so forth. And I'm just wondering how much the aldermen are uh, approving for these various. Um... We do budget um, for shredding each year. Um, I believe the budget that we carry, um, it's per department. Um, for instance, for the mayor and the board of aldermen's budget for shredding, it's usually about $750 a year. Okay. A year. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Berland, every item that was presented tonight is is uh, is already budgeted, has been already budgeted either in our you know operating budget or our capital improvement budget. That's most of what we talked about tonight. For example, the lockers at the pool. Okay. So those are all budgeted items, and they're all most of those are projected to be a little bit less than what we budgeted. So um, we don't do anything without a budget. And thank you very thank you very much. That sounds great. Okay, very good. And Mr. Winkleman, you have your hand up. Um, any questions for us? Simply want to share an incredible journey of trying to understand how Clayton has evolved physically and how I got in fascinated with the whole issue of approvals of planning projects that have built so many projects in Clayton that go from pure Laclede to, you know, the project that's on Foresight Point, you know, and the planning submissions and the laws that have been associated with them. And it has been so difficult. You all know how well there was. There were no documents available. You would have to go into the planning office and there would be these 11 by 17 binders, but you really couldn't see it. You really couldn't copy it. You couldn't take it home and you couldn't find a way to defend Maryland school and try to find a way to make it a public park. And you couldn't find the documents to show that the Centene proposal was totally incorrect when it was developing a circular drive drop off. So, th this discussion deals with the incredible intersection of let's call it your laws and the availability, the openness, the transparency of it to other citizens. And this is gonna be on your doorstep next week, right on Merrimack. So, and I sort of admired the money that you were giving to firefighters to have a 3D imagery of every building, but I'm not sure how that moves into, I'll call it energizing your, our planning community, which is our public, about where we are and what we might consider and how it impacts our previous laws and what we really want to create. Well, so, Mr. Winkleman, I thank you for those comments. And I think you'll find our uh, comprehensive planning process very interesting and right up your alley. And so I hope you'll pay attention to our notices and um, be part of that discussion. Thanks so much. I, I do want to mention that no zoning documents or anything associated with the zoning approval is is contained in this 
uh, request to dispose records. So uh, anything that, that goes through the zoning process uh, is retained. Also, uh, any of those permits or documents associated with a building that's newly constructed, we're required to retain those throughout the existence of that building. So as long as the building is standing, we have to retain uh, those original documents. So uh, none of that is impacted by this particular disposal of records. So anything that goes through the zoning process or that has been built in the city um, or is being built in the city, those are records that we'll keep in perpetuity. Thank you, very good. All right, any other discussion? All right, Alderman Lentz. I'll move to approve the disposal of records as listed. Second. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, very good. That completes our business, I think. Um, <laughs> that was a long agenda. Thank you everyone who came to share and uh, answer questions and all that good stuff. Appreciate it. I think at this point, we typically go around and have a little round table of what people have been doing. I suspect a lot of people have been celebrating the holidays, but we'll go around starting with Alderman Lentz. Um, I can't think of anything other than a sustainability, getting ready for a sustainability meeting, but um, so um, nothing related to report. Okay, very good. Alderman Berkowitz, anything to report? Yeah, we had a Parks and Rec uh, meeting last night, <clears throat> and the, the subject for most of the meeting was um, the pool and, and some of the issues they have with the pool at this point. One of the biggest issues is the availability of, of lifeguards to actually man the pool after um, mid-August. And um, so there was a lively discussion uh, about how to deal with that. And there was some resolutions that were, I, I believe that were voted on and passed. Um, but the bottom line is, is that after Labor Day, um, keeping the pool open for lap swimmers apparently is, is really not possible. Um, not presently anyway. And so, um, and if Tony wants to speak to that at right now, that would be fine. Um, but I, you know, it's, I, I think she knows more about it than I do, but, um, but that was the subject for last night's discussion. And, um, I think we came to a, we're at a crossroads when it comes to that, the, the pool and keeping it open, uh, after Labor Day. Interesting. Um, probably you need some time to work on that, but yeah, we'd love to know that we, I'm sure we all know a lot of people who love that lap swimming, you mm -hmm. know, in the mornings. So, okay. Thank you. Becky. Uh, we've had a couple of plan commission meetings since the last time we've all met. Um, but a lot of the, um, a lot of what we approved tonight was before the plan commission. And we've talked a lot about about the comp plan in the last couple of meetings. Um, and I also just wanted to give a shout out to Tony and staff at the center. The basketball season started in earnest with games last weekend and um, they did a great job. It was remarkable to see that many people back at the center um, and really cool. Um, they've started um, parents and people, actual spectators for games have to come in with a QR code, which I think was a great way to um, just make sure that the center stays a little bit more secure on those game days because people were just walking in saying, yeah, I'm here to say a game. So, um, but, I, you know, overall, I think it was great and it was well received. So, um, again, it's just exciting to see the center. So, you know, busy and doing well again. So, very good. Alderman Buse. Hi, uh, yes, I was with Ira last night and Tony with the Parks and Rec and yeah, the lifeguard discussion in the pool schedule was the primary topic. And um, also mentioned, it was also discussed that the Maryland Park grant had come through and that was going out to bid next month, which is great. And that the Anderson Park landscaping signage will be up this spring. Great. Anything? Um, yeah, the only thing I want to share about is a program that I went to on January 5th at the Kirkwood Public Library. Um, Vivian Gibson is a local author, and she spoke about um, a book that she wrote called On Becoming a Mill Creek Child. Um, and, or no, the book is called The Last Children of Mill Creek. Oh. And the event was called what I just said. Anyways, <laughs> 
Um, she was super um, engaging as a presenter and um, the story of Mill Creek is, uh, seems to be very similar um, to the story of our own black neighborhood and others in the region that were um, you know, targeted for destruction during the time of urban renewal. And so um, it was just very interesting um, and a really great program. Great. Alderman Fader, any? Um, last Thursday, I attended the community conference that uh, Keeley, uh, the Keeley organization uh, put on for the community as part of the PUD process in connection with their proposed apartment project, which is at Merrimack and uh, North Brentwood and Pershing. Um, and uh, I think the community who attended were, were generally receptive. That project seems to be moving in a good direction. And I guess we'll be hearing more about it in the next few months, but I thought that was, that was very positive. And we have an interesting meeting of the Community Equity Commission this Thursday at 5.30. I think we have seven religious leaders, people of various, uh, churches or other denominations who will be attending to talk to the, uh, the commission about their efforts uh, in terms of diversity and equity. So it should be an interesting discussion. I'm, I'm sure anybody else on the board or anyone else who's in the public who's interested in attending, I think it will be a good discussion. And that's here this Thursday at uh, 530. Very good. Thank you. I just have a couple of things. One is um, just to build on what you said, Becky, about Mill, the Mill Creek area. Um, first of all, one of the um, one of the people really involved in uh, sort of commemorating that and what what's going on in the city there is Gwen Moore, and she serves on our commemorative landscape task force. So there's been a lot of crossover of ideas and insight that relate to our commemoration of Black neighborhood, and she's she's really been a big part of that effort. Um, and then if you have not been to the new soccer stadium downtown, um, go over there and check it out because they have done an art installation that is really amazing in to honor Mill Creek. And one of the coolest things, it's a, you know art sculptures and all that, and the names and addresses of all the people who live there. It's pretty impactful when you see it. And I thought one of the most impactful things was they, they, they uh, reserved space uh, for about, I can't remember, but about four or five plots of actual footprints where those um, brownstone or townhomes were right along Market Street. And so it's a, it's a little grass yard with a bench and it has the address of the family that lived there. And it, it really, it really is, uh, it's really, they did a great job is what I want to say. And, um, it's very impactful and it's worth going down there to see it. Um, secondly, let's see, I, I wanna report that I have been interviewed by the Globe, the high school paper, and they wanted to talk to me about housing and, and specifically affordable housing. So there's, they're gonna, their articles are generally very long and very detailed. And I know that they were trying to contact uh, the chair of our uh, equity commission about this and hopefully they succeeded. Um, and so uh, that, that's nice that there's some interest there. Um, when did we go to the housing seminar? Was that before the last meeting? So did we already talk about that? Okay, we did, okay. Um, so never mind. And then um, I did a little, um, I did get to meet with some Cub Scouts last night and talk to them about government. And uh, they had lots of questions. and. They were unbelievably well informed. This is fifth graders. So they're doing a little a badge about uh, government and how it works. And so anyway, and laws and all that good stuff. So um, that was fun. Those are always really fun. So yeah, um, that's all I have, I think. And Mayor, I, I was interviewed by the Globe about trash. Oh, trash. trash. Well, sounds like your interview is probably a little bit more enlightening, but I talked about trash, so in Clinton, obviously. Well, I found for my interview, David sent me the presentation that was done at the Equity Commission uh, earlier this year or last year, um, and I found that information very, very helpful in terms of trying to help them understand 
you know, what the issues are and what cities can do. And there are a lot of things cities can do to forward this notion of what I like to call now attainable housing, new word I learned. So, all right, anything else from our city manager? Uh, I, I will just say this is my favorite kind of agenda because I think every department was represented with an item tonight. Um, I just want to say staff and department heads are all doing a great job and it's all reflected in, in what you see this evening. So thank you all very much. Very good comment. Yes, the best of the best. That's what we've got. All right. I think with that, we'll take a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Very good. Good night, everybody.